Good morning. Welcome to part five of our series, Getting the Worth Out of Life. Now, for those of us that may be joining us for the first time, we began this series a few weeks ago by talking about how we've all had a pretty rough year with everything that's been going on. And in my own personal time of wrestling with this, I began reading the book of Ephesians, which, as I've mentioned before, is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote while he was under house arrest meaning that he wrote the letter while he was in isolation, kind of like what we're going through now. And in that letter, he wrote, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And it got me thinking about this idea of worth. What makes something of worth? What is truly of worth? And as I was thinking about that, it really kind of hit me that there's a huge difference between getting the most out of life, which we say often, and getting the worth out of life. Because getting the most out of life really just focuses on ourselves. I mean, it has nothing to do with anyone else. And to be completely honest, it really does nothing to improve life itself. Because at its core, it's selfish and self-centered because it's always about satisfying and gratifying us. Now, I believe that we don't just want to have better. We want to be better. So in this series, we're going through the book of Ephesians and unpacking some of the things that Paul wrote while in isolation that show us a little bit more about how we get the worth out of life. With that in mind, today we're in chapter 5. And I'm going to begin by reading to you verses 8 to 16, which say this. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, Expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. That is why it said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So, as we've been going through Ephesians, there's been this kind of reoccurring theme that we keep running into. It's this idea that we were once something that has now been transformed. That through our relationship with Jesus, the persons we once were are no longer who we are now. We've done away with the old self and are now living new lives. So it's really not much of a surprise that we're seeing it again here in Ephesians 5. Paul's saying, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. He goes on to talk about not behaving like the people we see out in the world. He warns us to be careful of how we live, not living like fools, but instead living wisely. The way Paul puts it, it actually sounds kind of easy, doesn't it? Do you ever notice, though, how sometimes even the simplest of concepts are actually the hardest to do? I mean, the greatest war that you will ever fight will not be one of flesh and bone. You won't be taking up arms against a foreign oppressor or invading battalion. There won't be any explosions or gunfire. There won't be bodies lying on the ground, and no poems will be written about fallen heroes, and there will Never be any monuments erected in memory of it. No, the greatest war that you will ever fight will be spiritual in nature. It will be a war of faith, and you're going to fight it in here. And many of the battles that you will fight in this war will be a fight against fear. Fear is perhaps the greatest obstacle to the increase of your faith. It's the enemy's most powerful tool, or at least one of them, it's worse still that it's universal. I mean, every single one of us is going to have to face it at one point or another in our lives. 
fear causes us to freeze in one spot when we should be moving. In the life that we know is a journey, our faith should always be in motion. It should always be growing, always increasing, always strengthening. Faith should be nurtured and developed so that we as disciples of Jesus can mature in our faith to move into bigger and better things, the ones that have been planned for us long ago. Now, biblically speaking, this process is called sanctification. In the church, when we talk about it, it's really that process of our spiritual formation or our spiritual maturity. But whatever words we use, what we're talking about is growing in our faith life. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13, Paul says it was he, meaning Jesus, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In Hebrews 6 and 1, it says, Let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Now, even apart from this series, we have often talked in the church about how to live as Christians in a secular world. You know, those little things that you can do to be a better person or to love your neighbor even more. And when I think about it that way, it's kind of an interesting perspective to take as a pastor or a preacher, because the real change happens by the power of God, not by our attempts to alter our behavior. Transformation occurs by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by our persistence or our strength. And yet, in order to walk in the works of the kingdom, we must do our part in taking the steps that we're called to take in order to increase our faith life. I had some great conversations with people this week. We talked about all kinds of things, and I found myself greatly encouraged. And I was encouraged because what I've seen and what I have heard shows me that there is still a restlessness in the heart of the church to increase, to change, to grow. And that's a good thing, as we are all meant to mature. Now, faith is a journey, and with any journey, there are steps to take. I mean, even in our own biological life cycle, there are phases of existence or stages of life that we go through. Childhood, adolescence, adulthood, the golden years. I mean, each step, a distinctly different phase, each with its own trials and blessings and advances, each with its own works and its own rewards. And every one of us travels through each of these biological phases, and we really have no choice about it. We, I mean, we all have to mature. Well, faith is really no different in this regard. We are all called to mature in our faith, but spiritual maturity requires that we do the work and reap the reward. Just like how we must feed our bodies and our minds to grow and mature, in our natural physical development, so it is with our spiritual development. Maturity of faith requires feeding, learning, and practicing in order to grow. And you will have to make choices. You will have to take risks. You'll have to make a purposed effort. Faith is a journey. And in order to move on the journey, we need to take steps. The problem is, is that some of those steps are scary, and the enemy knows it. That is why fear is such a powerful tool of deception. Now, some of you may have heard the story of the time that Tracy made me ride the drop zone at Canada's Wonderland. And if you have heard it, you may remember that the reason the story is so funny is that I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> well, many years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Toronto, and while I was there, at that time, I went up the CN Tower. If you've ever been there, 
you know that they have a glass floor. Well, when I went up there, I didn't know that. I stepped off the elevator, walked a few steps, and there it was, right in front of me. An invisible barrier between me and a drop so terrifying that my stomach flipped in, upside down when I looked at it. I listened to the presentation that talked about how you could drive a tank over it and it wouldn't break. It didn't reassure me at all. <laughs> I mean, it was, it's glass. I mean, tell me how safe it is all you want. I was still terrified. You know, so I walked around a bit. I looked at the windows. I did one of the binocular things. And eventually I came back to the glass floor. Now, I still don't know what I was thinking or what was going through my head. But I decided eventually that if I was ever going to get past this, I needed to walk on the glass. But I was frozen. I mean, I couldn't move. I was so scared. I stood through three presentations as new groups of people cycled through the tour. It took me quite a while standing there staring at the floor before I could muster the courage to step out. But eventually I did. And you know what happened? It supported my weight. I mean, of course it did. The floor held me in place. It actually was safe. Weird, huh? But in my experience, that is an awful lot like what living our faith is like. We read about the things we're supposed to do as Christians, but no matter how many times we read them or hear someone tell us about them, sometimes our fear keeps us from stepping out and experiencing the truth. And often, the only way we accept the truth of the end result is by mustering a moment of courage, stepping out almost blindly, and just trusting God. We have to take the step. I mean, that's how we begin to develop our faith. I'm, I'm not talking about jumping into the deep end of the pool right away, you know, taking on the, the biggest risks first, unless that's your thing. I, I, what I'm talking about is just taking baby steps of trust that help develop your faith. Otherwise, we may stay stuck, frozen in place, staring at a glass floor. Spiritual maturity is very much about choosing and doing to move forward in our understanding and our faith. It really is a choice. I mean, in truth, every one of the commands that Jesus gave us comes down to us making a choice at some point or another. You know, Often when I talk to people about the part of their faith life that they're having difficulty walking in, they actually know what they need to do. They're just afraid to do it and, and are really just looking for a nudge to get moving. Once they've made a solid decision to do it, everything seems to change right away. In the end, it came down to a decision. The trick for us is to decide to do it no matter what and then follow through, no matter what. You know, one of the hardest times for a kid has to be on the playground at school. It's where young people are tested. It's a proving ground for our young one's character. When I was a kid, I certainly had my share of arguments, scuffs, and scrapes while trying to make my way in the world of children. You see, figuring out where we fit with other people can be tough sometimes. And it's just all the more amplified for kids. Our own children are no exception. You know, from time to time, they find themselves up against all kinds of difficult situations. And more often than not, the situation eventually has to be dealt with by an adult. Children just don't have the maturity to resolve most of the conflicts that they get into. And again, my kids are no exception to that rule. And Jamie in particular has had a difficult time with this. It's extra hard for him. He's got a lot of passion in his heart. I remember a long time ago, he got into a situation with some boys on the playground at school. They were teasing him with a ball, not letting him have it. And they were being quite cruel about it too, if I remember correctly. The situation got quite tense before anything was done. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised by Jamie's response to the situation. You see, instead of lashing out or getting physical, 
He stopped what he was doing, went to find a teacher, and explained calmly what was happening. Despite the fact that his emotions were flying high and that his normal response to these kinds of things was usually panic or freaking out, he made a choice, a very hard choice, to do the right thing. You see, he ignored what he was feeling and did what his father had told him to do like a bazillion times. Jamie chose what was right, and he made a decision to act on it, just like that, no matter what was going on inside him with his feelings. That's really the thing about spiritual maturity for us. We have to make the right choices no matter what we're feeling. You know the right way. Jesus has shown you the way, but it requires you making the decision to follow him no matter what you feel. And that's usually where we get tripped up. We can get so caught up in how we feel about things that we wind up acting on that instead of doing what God has shown us to do. I mean, it's not that we can't do it. It's that we don't do it. We're so used to listening to our heart or being true to ourselves or paying attention to how we feel that we avoid doing anything else, even if it was God himself that told us to do it. Now, if you've never heard this before, I pray that you hear it now. Your heart can and will often lead you astray. Your feelings will lie to you at some point. Our emotions are swayed by so many things, and not all of them are truth. I mean, let's be honest. Your feelings can be changed with something as insignificant as a cup of coffee. Most of the time, our feelings are a great asset, but we cannot chart the course of our lives based on how we feel, even more so when it's our faith life that we're talking about. I mean, just think of our example in Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus prayed in the garden, as the soldiers were coming to get him, to crucify him, he was in agony. I mean, if you want to talk about feelings, he was suffering such intense stress that his sweat contained drops of blood. Despite this, he knew what he had to do, and he surrendered to the will of the Father. Not my will, but yours. The very same is true for us. We must be prepared to make right decisions, no matter what's going on inside. That's one of the things that spiritual maturity depends on, that we make the right decision even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. It's about being honest when it seems like the perfect time to tell a little white lie. It's about choosing to love unconditionally when your habits are telling you to judge the person in front of you. It's about stepping up in every circumstance to actually do the work God has led you to, despite you maybe not feeling like it. It's about purposing yourself to make the choice God actually wants for you instead of making the choice you want and slapping God's name on it. So following Jesus is not easy all the time. He asks hard things of us. I mean, he does give us all the strength, courage, ability, and resources to do the things he asks, but they are often quite difficult. Let me give you just a few examples from Matthew chapter 5. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. How about this one? 
I'm going to pick on the guys for a minute. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. How about this one? You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Or better yet, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Spiritual maturity isn't about having it all together. It's about consistently and constantly moving forward. It's about growing. And that means choosing and doing. Paul wrote to the Philippian church, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. We know what we should do. We just have to do it. You know, this very day, almost every time I get into it with the kids, I'm asking them to tell me, or I'm telling them, that they know the right thing to do. <laughs> they know what it is already. One child says something mean to the other, and within seconds, they're both at each other. When they were little, they'd even sometimes start hitting each other. You know, they get fighting. And then they come crying to me about it. And when I ask them what the right thing to do is, they know. I mean, they always get the right answer, which is sometimes a little more frustrating for me than it needs to be. But they know what I'm trying to do as a parent is get them to actually do the thing they already know to be right. The simple and plain truth is knowing isn't enough. You're not meant to just memorize what the Bible says. You're meant to live it. Doing what we know shows that we're maturing. That's the way it is with children as they mature biologically, and that's the way it is with our own spiritual formation and maturity. James speaks about faith without works being dead. I've talked many times about how what we truly believe in our hearts, we will act upon. That our actions are the punctuations of our heart. If we are spiritually mature, what we do will reflect that. What we say will reflect that. How we react to things will flow out of that. We cannot live as spiritual infants and claim that we're mature. Take steps toward the goal. Choose and do. I'll tell you, a few years back, my mother entered a marathon. She had never done anything like that in her whole life. She couldn't even run it, but she did walk it, and she did finish it. And she didn't complete the marathon by leaping and trying to sprint all over the place, killing herself. She completed it by simply putting one foot in front of the other, even when she felt like lying down. That is often our journey of faith. Putting one foot in front of the other, even when we feel like lying down. So check your heart. Check your actions. 
Check your reactions. See that the things you do are consistent with the things you know. Make the decision to move and then move. And take the tough parts in stride. Do you have a relationship that's bringing you grief or a person in your life that's treating you awfully? Take a deep breath and pray a prayer of blessing over them. And see what Jesus does in you. You see something in someone that makes you uncomfortable? Well, then guard your heart from judgment. The enemy is going to try and use that one on you. Remember, Christ, Christ did not die for Christians. He died for everyone, everywhere. And as Christians, we're not to judge those other people. And you know that. How about gossip? We don't gossip. We are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Do you think that the little white lie you told your somebody or another was justified because it made the situation easier? Well, it didn't. Not really. And it won't. Learn to tell the truth in love and with grace. Choose what's right and walk in that. I mean, it'll mean doing the hard thing in the moment sometimes. It'll mean forcing yourself to do the opposite of what you feel sometimes. But that is what will bring the good fruit of righteousness, peace, and love, and the blessing of God into your life. Paul says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord, so live as people of light. The thing about light is that it penetrates. It cuts through darkness, and darkness has no power over it. I remember when we were still really little, the summers were so hot and humid that we couldn't sleep at night sometimes. It's just something about the Ottawa area. It gets so thick with heat and humidity that it's miserable. So when it got bad like that, my parents would let our my brothers and I sleep in the basement because it was cool down there. But once the lights were out, there were no windows in the room that we were in and we were down in the basement. So it became pitch dark. You could literally wave your hand in front of your face and see nothing. Well, I woke up one night and was a little disoriented. You know how it is. You wake up sometimes, you're not sure where you are for a few seconds. Well, add to that that I couldn't see anything. And I, when I, it dawned on me where I was, I couldn't figure out where in the room I was. And uh, I had no idea where the door was and I had to go. You know what I mean? So I started feeling around and as it turns out, I was right next to where the camping equipment was. And one of the first things I put my hand on was a box of matches. So I lit one just so I could see the door. Now, the second I lit that match, I could see almost everything. One single tiny little flame, and I could pretty much see the whole room. The desk over in the corner, my brothers sleeping on the floor in their sleeping bags, and across the way on the other side of the room, I could even see the door which led upstairs to the bathroom. But I also saw our super flashlight from among the camping gear. Now, the thing was like a floodlight. I mean, it was way better and way safer than the match I had in my hand that was about to go out. So I picked it up and I turned it on. And suddenly it was like I was standing on the surface of the sun. I mean, it was so bright. I was blinded for a moment while my eyes adjusted to the light. And even after they did, I had to squint my eyes because it was so bright. There's a big difference between the light of one little match and the floodlight. I want to be a floodlight. You can know Jesus and mature very little and have the light of a little match. Or you can embrace the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Walk in your faith, doing what God has called you to do. Mature greatly in your spirit and cast the light of a floodlight into a darkened world. Paul said, once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord.
So live as people of light. Be a floodlight.